But I want to start this morning in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 to 16. And uh, I want to talk about Jesus' uh, when, he, when he shares the Beatitudes in chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 11. Uh, and talk about what Jesus says. Now, God, God blesses you, it says, when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. I love this because the Bible says that, that, that God blesses you. Say, God blesses, me God blesses me when people persecute me. Okay? Verse 12 says this. Jesus goes on to say, be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. And so I read this, and, and it amazes me because so many times, um, you know, the church is trying sometimes to be seeker-friendly, right? We don't want to offend people, so we're going to be careful what we preach about and what we talk about because we don't want to offend people. We don't want to get people uh, upset with us, and we don't want to be persecuted. But Jesus says something very, very, very clear here, is that you're blessed when you're persecuted because you're bringing truth. Amen. Right? And so I believe we have to always approach people with love and with compassion and with mercy, but we can't compromise the message to cause people to be comfortable. Amen? We should make people feel comfortable in the fact that we're showing them unconditional love, we're caring for them, but we don't compromise. And Jesus is coming here to say, you know, uh, uh, Jesus isn't into hyper grace. Is really what he's saying here. And I say hyper grace when I mean it's just, it's all about, it's all about mercy. It's all about grace. And don't worry, God loves God. There's no judgment. There's no condemnation. And it goes on and on and on. But we need to realize this is that Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. So God wants us to be in a process of preparing our hearts, walking with Him and changing our lives. Okay. And, and, and there's something about standing up for what's right. And especially in a day and age we live in today, you know, where truth is, you know, truth can be different for every person, right? We want to be politically correct, right, in society. But, but, but there's something about standing up for what's right. And I believe God wants us to be a people who, in love, stand up for truth, stand up for what's right. It doesn't matter if people persecute you because they persecuted the prophets. You know, have you ever thought about this? I think about this sometimes. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and he's building a boat because God said, I want you to build an ark for the saving of your family. And the Bible says that he preached righteousness, but he could only save his own family. How many know he didn't have a very big congregation on that boat? And so we need to be loving, we need to be caring, but if, if people don't come to Christ, that's not our issue. Can I hear an amen? So we bring the gospel. And... Um, John chapter 3, verse 16 to 20 says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him uh, will not perish but have everlasting life. Okay? Jesus came to save, not condemn. That's what Jesus did. He came to save, not condemn. Now let's look at verse 18. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Jesus, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged. Okay? For not believing in God's one and only Son. Next verse. And this judgment is based on the fact that God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. Okay? Verse 20. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear that their sins will be exposed. And it used to drive me nuts because I was going to work. I was in Bible school. I would spend, you know, I wasn't married at the time, didn't have kids. So I'd, I'd go home and I'd spend t- two hours on my guitar worshiping God and praying and talking to God and going to church services and dealing with my life, you know. And I had lots of spare time. How many remember those days? Some of you have those days right now. But I spent a lot of time. And then I'd go to work and I was a machinist. I'd go to work and I'd get around people and they would get irritated with me. Why? Because the light was coming into the darkness, and they didn't comprehend it, and they refused to go near it for fear that their sins will be exposed. And I had people, I remember going to work, and they'd be like, oh, there's preacher boy, you know, let's stay away from him. And, or I'd, I'd walk in a room, and they'd all be swearing, and all of a sudden they'd be like talking like Mother Teresa, you know, and hey, you know, trying to impress me. Why? Because the presence of God goes with us as a people of God. 
And that's why Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted, because that means you have the presence of God. When you go into a room and people are there and they're living in sin, there's something in them, there's a fear that, oh, I, I don't want my sin to be exposed. If you can walk into a room and people, and people don't feel convicted that there's a problem, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted, right? For righteousness sake. So people's fear comes and they're afraid that their sins will be exposed, okay? All those who hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear that their sins will be exposed, okay? See, people are separated from God until they meet Christ, but people are still valuable to God. And, and this is the thing that we have to understand, that people are valuable to God whether they're Christian or not. Can you hear an amen? I mean really, really valuable. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Like, think about that. When you had all, like everything was a mess in your life, and sometimes there's still messes in our life, but when you were like far, far from God, God was thinking about you. And he was going after you. That, that's, that's how God demonstrated his love. All right? We teach people in the church about who they are in Christ, but we forget to teach them who they are to Christ. And so you can teach a Christian about who they are in Christ and the authority that they have and all their rights and all the promises that are theirs. And they can walk around really confident, but when they get around unsaved people, they, they buckle because they don't know how valuable they are to Christ. How many know you need both? You need to know who God is in you, but you need to know who God created you to be as well. See, God created you to be an answer to the problem in the earth. Whatever you do, God put a gift mix in you. He says, I'm going, to create, I'm going to create David, and I'm going to put David in the earth, and I'm going to have him at this time, in this season, at this hour, because there's going to be problems in the earth that only David will be able to answer. Wh whatever your name is, God has a plan and a purpose for you. He put you here, saved or unsaved. You're here to fix problems in the earth. Someone who's a doctor who doesn't know Jesus yet, he's here and he's working, uh, help, saving lives. He's, he's taking care of a problem in the earth. God has value on people. Whether you're a Christian or not, God values people. Okay? And um, the Bible gives us a really clear picture of how he values. Jesus does um, Give us a really clear picture here. And I want to see if I have the notes here for that, because I don't know if I do. Yeah, go to Luke chapter 15, verse 1 to 10, Josiah. Jesus is giving a parable here, and look what he says. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Okay? And this made the religious people, the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law, complain that he was associating with such sinful people. All right? Even eating with them. See, we need to be around people who don't know God because Jesus didn't, he didn't come for the healthy, he came for the sick. And religious people don't like it when, you know, we rub shoulders and get too cozied up with the unsaved because, you know, we could get defiled. And the, and the Pharisees didn't like this, but Jesus did it anyway. And look what it says in verse 3, and Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he will joyfully carry it on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have, haven't strayed away. So Jesus is telling us what it looks like in heaven. When one of you, maybe you're sitting in this room and you've never made a commitment to Christ. Today, if you make a decision, I'm going to follow Jesus. The Bible says in heaven, there's a party. Like the angels start rejoicing. Woo, yeah, and they're rejoicing and they're, they're shouting and they're clapping and they're dancing. Right? Over one. 
And there's people getting saved every day all over the world in churches like this on a Sunday morning and throughout the week. People are giving their heart to Christ. So that tells me that heaven is party constantly. Right? Uh, could you imagine? Like, it's like, woo! And, you know, some people that go to more traditional churches are going to be really surprised when they get there. They're going to be like, man, we could have been a little more charismatic. That's just my point. I just leave it there. But here's another parable Jesus gives, explaining his father. He says, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. In the same way there is joy in the presence of God's angels when one sinner repents. Say one. one. It only takes one. Why would God rejoice? It's because he values people. I want to give you the characteristics of a lost coin. Can you open that for me? Characteristics of a lost coin. Are you ready? Number one, a coin is mindless, and a coin doesn't realize it's lost. Simple. And I don't know about you, but I, when I come around people and I start talking about God, they don't realize they're lost. In fact, they think I'm crazy. But see, it doesn't matter because God gave me this amazing tool that I can use. It's called my testimony. So too many times we're busy trying to, to figure out the scriptures we're going to share or the strategy of how we're going to get people to come to Jesus. All you have to do is give your testimony. When you share your story, people go, hey man, really? If God could do that for you, maybe he could do it for me. And faith is born, and without faith it's impossible to please God. So all of a sudden, they're accessing faith. Does that make sense? And so use your testimony. Number two, a coin has nothing to do with getting lost. It really doesn't. Uh, it, it, you know, the Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In fact, in Adam, all have sinned. When Adam sinned in the garden, the sin nature came in, and everyone born after him was born with a sin nature in their DNA, and they're separated from God. That's why Jesus had to come through a virgin because if he came through a human man, the sin nature would have came right with it. Right? And so, coin has nothing to do with getting lost. So, the number three thing, third characteristic, it didn't willingly get lost. And the fourth one is, there's no value in the coin apart from the owner. And this is the thing, is that people don't realize their value. They don't understand until they truly meet Christ, they don't realize what they're here for. They don't realize their purpose. And there, there's always that question, like, what, what am I here for? Where am I going? You know, what's my destiny? And, and there's always these questions. And, and when you find Christ, when you find the Father, you have value. How many can remember a time when you found Christ and the value suddenly came and you realize that you have a purpose, you realize that you're loved, you realize that God has a plan for your life? Can I give you the characteristics of lost sheep? Okay. She, uh, the characteristics of sheep. Sheep aren't known to be sharp. Really. Like, they just wander. I've seen that, so even my own life, you know, I wander so easily sometimes, just kind of wander away, and it's kind of like, you know, God comes so gently by His Spirit and say, Travis, you're off path, you got a bad attitude, you didn't do your devotions, you know, whatever. And He begins to woo us back, because we're not necessarily very sharp, are we, sometimes? So sheep aren't always sharp. Number two, sheep stray. It has to do with not being sharp. Um... And number three, sheep have no strength. I don't know if you've ever seen like a, a sheep, you know, fight against a wolf or a bear or something like, you know, turn into like killer sheep. It doesn't happen. They're very docile animals, and they even they just let you flip them on their back and you can shear them. They're very they're very docile. They have no strength. And you might think you have strength. You might think you have everything you need to get through life. But without Christ, there's no strength. For the God of this world, Satan, has blinded our eyes. And he's coming after to destroy people's lives. 
right? But God is there. To, he's our defender. He's our protector. He's the one who, who takes care of the unseen realm so that we can live in victory. We have no strength without God. We might think we have strength, but we have none. And so just like sheep, we have no strength. And another thing with a sheep is a sheep can't find their way. They need someone to lead them. And they don't know their way back. So say, God cares for the lost. Now, Jesus gives another parable. The other parable, I'm not going to read it because you all know it, I'm sure, is the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son now is talking about a backslider. Maybe one of us, maybe, you know. It's not talking about those who never knew Christ because they are lost. Backslider, actually, no one has to go looking for the son because the son knows his way back to the father. Right? And so those, the prodigal son is just about backsliders. And the beautiful thing with the prodigal son is the father is waiting for him, looking for his arrival. So again, you see the love of God. You see the heart of the father saying, I, you have value. I'm waiting for you to come back. I'm waiting you to turn back. So how many think we've got a good father? Yeah. All right. The son knows his way back home and God is waiting. So people who are born spiritually lost... They cannot get back to God on their own, and people don't seek after God on their own. They just don't, okay? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, it says this, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against him. He's no longer holding people's sin against them. Sorry. God's not holding people's sins against them. He's, he's paid for their sins. All they have to do is by faith enter into a relationship. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. I want you to say, I'm Christ's ambassador. God is making his appeal through me. We speak for Christ when we plead. Say it. Come back to God. And you know, we spend so much time, time trying to convince people they're sinners. And sometimes there's a time for that if people are hard in their hearts. But we need to be telling people, need, you got to reconcile with God. He's no longer holding your sins against you. He's not, he's not looking at your baggage and making a deal about it. He's paid for that. You just need to, by faith, come into relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? And I believe that there's two things that God wants us as Christians to do for Him. Say two things. The first thing is we, want, we need a season. And the second thing is we need a shine. Say season and shine. Okay. I'll run you through that really quickly here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, as we move on, says, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under the basket. Instead, the lamp is placed on the stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father okay and um here's here's the thing god has called us to season and to shine i just realized i didn't have my notes there so i'm going to check here the word season actually is is comes from the greek word which means to become insipid to become insipid Okay, it means to become a fool, to lose savor. Okay, uh, it means uninteresting. It means boring. It means dull. It means spiritless, zestless, lifeless, characterless, lacking personality, lacking charisma, wishy-washy. That's what it means. If you do the, you take the the Greek word and you. Look, it means all that. And, 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 and here's the thing. 
is that we're, we're always so busy in trying, and as, as you probably figured out I'm talking about getting people saved, talking about evangelism this morning, right? So many times we're trying to find the formula or we feel we're not ready to share our testimony or we feel like we need to learn a little bit more. We don't have enough answers. If people ask answers, we're not going to have the right answer. And we, we get all concerned with that. But the thing that actually gets people saved, the thing that gets people excited about God is when we come and we have charisma, when we, when we, have, we have personality, when we have charisma, when we have passion about God in our lives. Can I hear an Amen. All right, But when we become wishy-washy, it's hard to get people saved. Right? And like, if you think about the woman at the well, we talked about her a few weeks ago. Like, she, she had, like, no friends. She had a lot of baggage. She had uh, five husbands that she's now divorced from. Now she's living common law. She's got a bunch of baggage. People know her as a, the lady with issues. And, and nobody wants to hang with this girl. And all of a sudden, she encounters Jesus. She goes back to the community. And something has so shifted in her life that people see her. And she's so excited about this Jesus guy that the whole town follows this nobody to meet Jesus. Why? Because she had personality, she had charisma, she had excitement, she had passion. She wasn't wishy-washy with her message. And so just who you are right now, you can, if you would allow God to touch your heart and return to your first love and get passionate about God and start telling your story everywhere you go, hey, this is what God did in my life. And, you, and they might persecute you, but don't worry, because God's going to bless you for it. right? And just get excited about your story. And you watch, people will say, I, I, I want to know, I want to know this Jesus. Right. Amen? Yeah. This is what God is doing. He's wanting to revive his church. Amen. In Revelations, the church of Laodicea, the Lord appears and says, Listen, you, 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 you know, you've got it all down. You know who the false teachers are. You teach the word. I know your works. They're awesome. And you got it all together. But then he goes, I got this one thing against you. Return to your first love. Because that's what attracts the lost. Amen? So we want to have charisma. We want to be excited about what God is doing. The next thing that salt does is it preserves. Salt preserves. You know... They didn't always have refrigeration. That's kind of a new thing, right? When did refrigeration was probably invented, what, 200 years, 100 years ago, whatever. But before that, people would salt. They put water and they'd ton of salt and they put their meat in there and they would salt it. It would actually preserve their meat. And our, our saltiness actually preserves our nation. It preserves our family. It preserves our lineage when we stand for truth and we don't compromise. Isn't that good? Amen. So what I want to do as we're going to be finishing off in a few minutes is I just want to show you a video of a church that was planted. It was actually through Elevation, but it was actually planted in a small community. But I want you to note something. It exploded, and I'm going to tell you why it exploded, because people, they were, uh, they were seasoned. They were excited about God, they were, and people got attracted to it. And I want to see, you'll see the fruit of what happened. So we're going to start that video. Amen. Isn't that awesome? <clears throat> and I think that town's very similar to the size of our town. So how many know, how many know that um, it was just their passion of we need people to experience Jesus the way we have? And I just want to, why don't we stand? We're going to pray just briefly and ask God to, to come. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. Um, those of us in this place that have been touched by you. We have a story. We have a testimony. And we see this and our faith is encouraged. God, help us to go around through our week just touching base with people and sharing our story of how you've touched our life. That's all you're asking is to share our story, God, and you'll do the rest. So God, give us opportunities this week to share our story, not to bring people to our belief system, but to bring them to the person of Jesus Christ. Because you're the one who transforms lives in Jesus' name. David, would you just go on the keys for a second there? Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for every person in this place right now. Right now, Father, I pray, God, that if there's anybody in this place that does not know you, doesn't have a relationship with you, Jesus, maybe they've been to church, maybe, you know, they've known about you, but they've never had an encounter with you where their life is transformed. 
Would you just speak to their heart right now, God, that you just pull on their heartstrings and invite them into a relationship with you. With every eye shut, every head bowed, if that's you, just lift your hands. Say, I want to make a decision today to follow Jesus with my life. I want to have a relationship with Christ. Hallelujah. That's great. If you're in this place and you're, you're like the prodigal, you know your way back home. You're not lost anymore. You know your way, but you've been away from the Lord. Just lift your hands. I want to pray with you today. Anybody in this place? Amen. I see your hand. That's awesome. One hand went up. That's wonderful. Can we all just pray with this person? Just say, Heavenly Father, I choose to come back to you today. You're the way. You're the truth. And you give me all the life I need. And I surrender my life to you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you that this place is going to be filled with people. Even in the months to come, as we give these altar calls, there's going to be 30 hands going up. There's going to be hands going up because people are hungry for Jesus. They're not hungry for religion. They're hungry for Jesus. So bless us this week. Did this minister anybody today? Amen. So your assignment this week is just tell your story to somebody. And you know what? You might get persecuted, but you get a, a blessing in heaven for it. Maybe you get another room on your mansion. I don't know what happens, but something good's happening in heaven when you get persecuted. Amen.